In this short video, I will present you an overview of what ketamine is, where it came from and how it's used in medicine. Welcome to my channel. My name is Samuel Kohtala. I'm a pharmacist and a neuroscientist with a passion for both brains and drugs. For the past five years or so, I've been studying the molecular mechanisms of various anesthetic drugs, including ketamine, with a particular interest in how these different drugs may modulate neuronal plasticity and how these effects could be used to treat psychiatric disorders. The first question is, of course, where did ketamine come from? Does it grow in a tree? No. The story of ketamine begins in the 1950s when the Park Davis Pharmaceutical Company was investigating a, a group of drugs known as aryl cyclohexyl amines. One of these molecules was PCP, which was brought to the market as an anesthetic drug. Now, PCP was not an ideal drug by any standards. In fact, some of the patients anesthetized with PCP experienced severe post-operative psychosis or in some cases uh, extreme dysphoria. But the company knew that this class of drugs had potential and they directed efforts towards synthesizing novel arylcyclohexylamine compounds perhaps compounds that have a less severe set of side effects. It was a dark and stormy night, 1962, Anno Domini, when Professor Calvin Lee Stevens witnessed a white crystalline solid emerge in the bottom of an Erlenmeyer ball. The solid was referred to as CI581, but it became later known as ketamine. Now, ketamine was studied in the preclinical context where it was found to be a suitable candidate for further research. Reportedly, the first human being received ketamine on August 3rd, 1964. These human trials were led by Dr. Edward Domino. Some sources suggest that the first subjects to receive ketamine were prisoners. The results of these studies were remarkable. Ketamine was found to be a safe and effective anesthetic and the incidence of side effects was much much less than that of PCP. However, most subjects still described strange behaviors like a feeling of being detached from one's sensory perception, a feeling of floating in outer space, or not being able to feel their arms and legs. When the results from these ketamine studies were about to be published, the researchers didn't really know how to describe these dreamy experiences ketamine tend to induce. Ultimately, it was Ed Domino's wife who coined the term dissociative anesthetic. Following the completion of these clinical trials, ketamine reached the market relatively fast and ultimately replaced PCP. The true test for this new anesthetic was the Vietnam War, where it was given to wounded soldiers on the battlefield. Now, ketamine is a good drug for battlefield conditions because it has a wide safety profile and it can be given as an intramuscular injection. Moreover, Ketamine essentially upkeeps the core functions of the body so that there is no need for an anesthesiologist to monitor the patient or there's no need for uh, procedures like intubation. These effects combined with the fact that ketamine is also an effective painkiller made it an ideal drug for emergency medicine. Surprisingly, already in the 1970s, ketamine was investigated in the psychiatric context. In these very early studies, rather large doses of ketamine were given to psychiatric patients 
with the intention to facilitate psychotherapy. However, these studies were rather poorly controlled and they essentially don't live up to the standards of today's clinical research and thus remained rather obscure. Now, in the 1980s, ketamine was shown to act through the blockade of an metal D aspartate or NMDA receptors. These receptors are the key components of glutamatergic neurotransmission along with the AMPA and kinate receptors. At that time, there were also concerns over ketamine's neurotoxicity due to the work of John Olney and colleagues. They demonstrated that high doses of ketamine could produce so-called Olney's lesions in the brains of rodents. There is no evidence that the currently used doses of ketamine in clinical medicine would result in neurotoxicity. However, very high doses of ketamine abused either daily or weekly over the period of months or years have been shown to induce cognitive impairment and also cortical atrophy. Now, as the glutamatergic system became a point of interest for those studying schizophrenia, ketamine and other NMDA receptor antagonists were used to model some of the symptoms of schizophrenia. And this work is still uh, actively ongoing. As ketamine use in anesthesia became uh, more and more common, researchers also started to investigate the use of ketamine in treating, for example, chronic pain and uh, psychiatric disorders. In the year 2000, the study by Berman and colleagues was the first to demonstrate the rapid antidepressant effects of ketamine. This was the first randomized controlled clinical trial of ketamine for the treatment of depression. In this study, ketamine was given at a dose of 0.5 mg per kilogram over a 40-minute infusion. Many similar studies followed and collectively the results demonstrated ketamine to be an effective rapid-acting antidepressant drug which could also ameliorate depression in treatment-resistant patients. These are patients who have tried several conventional antidepressant drugs but still remain without a significant benefit. So, in this sense, ketamine was truly a revolutionary new treatment. But what does rapid acting really mean in this context? Based on my knowledge of the literature and also my discussions with some of the clinical researchers, I've come to the impression that the effects of ketamine typically already begin within the infusion. These effects then become more prominent in the following hours and typically reach a peak around 24 hours after the treatment. This is remarkably fast when compared to conventional antidepressant treatments which have to be taken daily for weeks or even months before any significant effects uh, begin to emerge. Unfortunately, the effects of ketamine are sustained for only up to a week or two and after that the symptoms of depression then begin to re-emerge. Anyways, these studies resulted in a surge of research trying to uncover the precise mechanisms underlying ketamine's effects. For the pharmaceutical industry, this was also a big thing. Pharmaceutical companies now had a new neurotransmitter system to focus on. Instead of producing another monominergic or accessory type of drug, like they had been doing for the past several decades, they started to explore the possibilities of modulating a glutamatergic neurotransmission. In 2010, a seminal study from the laboratory of the late Ronald Duman demonstrated that ketamine could upregulate markers of synaptic plasticity as well as promote the formation of new dendritic spines. This and other studies prompted researchers to investigate the effects of ketamine on neurotrophic signaling pathways. This line of work is still very much ongoing. 
Now, just recently, the intranasal formulation of S-ketamine, one of the two ketamine isomers, the other being R-ketamine, was approved by the FDA and the European Medicines Agency. And it is to be expected that in the upcoming years, the treatment of depression with ketamine will become much, much more widespread. Notably, there are no new drugs that would match the effects of ketamine in terms of their uh, clinical potency. While many candidates have been discovered in preclinical research, it has been uh, surprisingly difficult to translate these findings into the clinic. Now, what the field lacks in the number of clinically effective new rapid antidepressant compounds we truly do have in the numbers of hypotheses aiming to explain ketamine's effects. My most recent work has been focused on trying to understand the interconnection between ketamine and the neurobiology of sleep, but other hypotheses have proposed that, for example, ketamine's effects are mediated by the hydroxynoketamine metabolite, or that ketamine would be directly binding into track B receptors and thus promote synaptic plasticity. These themes I will hopefully discuss in my uh, upcoming videos, so stay tuned. I hope you found this a brief overview of ketamine informative and useful. Click like to support my channel and subscribe for more future neuropharmacology content. Thank you for watching this video and I hope to see you soon.